Hi, this is Peter Clayton with Total Picture Radio. The following presentation was recorded June 27, 2014 at HR Tech Tank, New York, and features Michael Bagelman, CEO of Jobberate, a company providing predictive analytics for HR and recruitment. Michael's topic at HR Tech Tank, New York, working with recruitment process outsourcing, RPO, and the human resource outsourcing, HRO industries. Here's Michael Bagelman. The perspective you're going to hear is just from a guy who did it like a lot of times. Um, uh, so, you know, just quick background. Um, right now, I, I, I'm involved with a startup. Prior to that, um, I ran the, the global recruitment outsourcing business for the Deco Group. We rebranded as a company called Pontoon. I recently, and the joke was I was sort of employee zero. I was hired as a consultant by the CEO to help him understand what is this RPO MSB thing. And then I became employee one, uh, which is, you know, a guy with no team, you know, it's sort of a vision. And somehow I convinced him I got six million bucks from their CFO to go out and build this thing. Uh, and I think I would say actually raising money from your, a Swiss CFO is probably harder than venture capital. Um, <laughs> as hard as venture capital is, go get six million dollars from a Swiss banker, infinitely harder. Uh, so anyways, we convinced him to do that, and we really never looked back. We did a couple acquisitions along the way. Uh, when I had left, we were at about 400 people. We were about 100 clients, 42 countries. And we did our claim to fame is we did about one hire every six and a half minutes somewhere around the world. So it was kind of crazy. I became this sort of almost a little public utility. By the way, DECA was very good at making public utilities. You know, it's sort of... Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. So we kind of have to industrialize everything there. So that, that's kind of my thing. Um, and then prior to that, I, I ran what is now the HR Technology and Services Association. It used to be called the HROA. I was the founding executive director. I'm the idiot that they convinced to kind of take this idea and $1,400 in the bank and build this industry called HRO. I remember literally inventing the acronyms at, at a bar in Livingston, New Jersey over martinis. Wait, oh, HRO, that sounds great. Let's put that in. Oh, wait, we should call that a magazine. Oh, there it comes out. And I mean, I'm somewhat dramatizing, but I'm really not dramatizing it. To some extent, it was almost like that. It was kind of throw stuff against the wall and like, ooh, that's spaghetti stuck. Let's run with that. Uh, so, you know, and then prior to that, I, I did a couple of stints in technology. We had. Uh, I'd worked for Jim Goldman, if the name sounds familiar, he was partner of Jeff Taylor, I started this little thing called Monster Board. Yeah, so after Jeff got pissed off and left and got money from McKelvey, Jim said, you know what, I'm gonna build a better job board. So he hired Bagelman to do that. Um, it's kind of funny, uh, not so much, because right at the time we were going to market, the market crashed. This was, I believe, September 10th, 2001. Um, in fact, I was on a plane heading to Vegas. And I got there and I had 58 messages when I woke up and everybody's like, I just want to make sure you're okay because I was supposed to fly the next day. And serendipitously, I changed my flight and I flew out the night before. So it's kind of weird. So we, uh, you know, let's say timing kind of sucked. Um, but, you know, we still worked through. Ultimately, we wound up packaging that technology business with an offline recruitment agency called JWG Associates. And we sold it to, of all people, Andy McKelvey <laughs> at TFPW, ironically. The people that we were trying to beat, uh, Andy has passed away since then. So it was really great. We were doing meta search and x-ray and all this crap people were doing now like 15 years ago. So I'm really jaded when people say I have a really great technology. I'm like, really? Okay, cool. I'm all ears. Because to me, everything that I've kind of seen has been just really incremental <clears throat> evolution of what we have. But there's a reason for that. So this, I'm not being negative. This is like teeing you up for how to actually do this. So, so anyway, and just in general, you know, I, I've been doing this for almost 18 years. I started when I was four, so I'm celebrating my 22nd. Well, no, not really. Okay. There's, a, there's an HR standard. Yeah, there is. Okay. So okay. So anyway, so this is kind of my, my brief background. Um, here's my personal experience of being an early adopter. Uh, somebody was asking, how do we target early adopters? I had to shut my mouth because otherwise I'd have nothing to talk about. Um, so my personal experience of being an adopt, it's kind of funny, so I'm going to take you down this path. So when I was building the RPO business of the Deco, I said, okay, we are the 90-second RPO in a completely undifferentiated space. And the only thing that differentiated us was how good our salespeople were and how slick those PowerPoint decks, because we were basically selling to sheep. Right? And I'm not being negative, but this is exactly what was happening. So, so essentially, I was tasked with building a global business with nothing, and completely undifferentiated, you know, and I signed up for this willingly. Um, and what I realized is that this is going to sound really stupid, but the root word to differentiation is different. <laughs> we sometimes forget, we think differentiation means better. 
No, differentiation does not mean better. It means different, which by definition, Wiki will tell you about half the people will hate you. So everybody wants to differentiate. Ready? Half the people are going to hate you. So if you don't want to differentiate, then build the same crap everybody else has. So the reality is we had a choice. The choice is I could either build the same crap everybody else had. Sorry about the crap. I've been in Europe. I think we could say that in Europe, right? Where do you go? I could even throw a few S's and F's in there. Um, <laughs> totally okay. U.S., not so okay. It's totally okay. In fact, a few kind of desirable. Um, so, so what's interesting is, is that uh, what, the way I chose to differentiate our business, I'll kind of cut to the chase, is we positioned ourselves as thought leaders and people that took risk and introduced new technology to the market. That was it. It was a conscious decision that we made because it said anything else is too difficult. And it became what I call mental masturbation. Right? And I didn't want to do that, so I decided, hey, I'm going to go out and find clients that want it to be different. So as opposed to convincing people that they should be different, this is the drum roll hi-hat, I stopped doing that and I started looking for clients who wanted to be different. So our sales conversion ratio was like 8 out of 10. We never lost deals we've been on. We talked about the fact, this is why I never competed with Sue. Because he funded a competitor and we literally never bid on the same deals. We were like planes. We all fly in the same sky but never crash. I was here, they were there, somebody else was there. So we developed our own jet stream, if you would, and how we would go to market. So I learned that, hey, if I do this, and most RPOs are built by very entrepreneurial people, and they're looking for the quick buck, and it's really services veiled with some mystique of technology, if we actually brought really cool technology to the market, we're going to differentiate. Half the people are going to hate us, but the people that love us will really love us. So the idea was, how do you get the clients that love you to really, really love you? And you could actually build a business from that. So that was the, the thought process. So I kind of have some claims to fame, and I know all these entrepreneurs, you could call them. So higher view, I was literally their first client. I knew Mark really well when he was literally a guy in Utah. And, and he would ask me to go to Best Buy, because I'm in New Hampshire, to buy cameras, because we have no sales tax. So we would be on these Sunday calls going, dude, you got to buy me some cameras. They're like 22 bucks. Here's my credit card number. I'm like, I got it. You can just send me a check. And I'm like, Mark, you got to stop the camera. I'm like, this is a really bad business. He's like, yeah, but it's employer branding. I'm like, you got to stop the camera. This is a really bad business. And over and over and over. And eventually I helped him write his first PowerPoint deck to go out and speak to investors. And then Chip joined him from Schwab. And I know Chip, so it was kind of really wild to see that. I was this close to working for him. But I had made a commitment to Deco, so I kind of stayed the course. It was really, really close. So we kind of took them. So what was my benefit of being one of their early adopters? Well, I got a sweetheart deal, just to be open about that, because, you know, this was quid pro quo. What do you get? What you get is an engaged, educated buyer that's willing to put your logo on the slide and not do this black box sort of like, oh, this is our capability. So we prominently sort of displayed their stuff. We took them to market. We were proud of it. And half the people said, that is the stupidest thing. The other half the people said, isn't it illegal? And it's just like on and on and on. Yeah. So what I would do is have a week weekly. Do you remember that? Isn't video interviewing illegal? So if you don't, that tells you how early of an adopter I was. Right? I was like literally, you're talking about due diligence for technology. I'm like with the, like the EEOC people on the phone with the client going, this is totally legit. So it's really, really, really funny. So, so we were early adopters and we've watched them evolve. So what was my, what was my benefit as a buyer? Because I was an RPO. My benefit was I differentiated. I had an 18-month runway because here's what would happen. Mark would build a really great business and then he would sell it to everybody. And I knew that. So I knew the deal going in that if I was going to be the innovator, I would literally have to work my butt off to have an 18-month competitive advantage. And the second I stopped, that erodes. Because it became a wave, I just needed to be ahead of the wave. Otherwise, I couldn't surf it. So that was my thing. So how I realized, and I'm kind of saying to you, if you're going out looking for prospects, somebody said, where do you find them? Think about the type of personality that you're looking for, right? These are the types of people that will sort of work with you. So another one was, um, you know, Avature. So this is kind of a joke as Dimitri was sort of out of, the Yahoo hot jobs thing. This is when he used to be in New York. I mean, now he's like, he hasn't been in America in three years, I don't think. I think he's never left Brazil. I think he's afraid to leave like the server room because people are going to steal his, I don't know what it is. But, 
but he just ne never <laughs> leaves there. Like, he's invisible. So we were literally their first client, too. And I remember when we migrated our entire entire da data warehouse over to his systems, they literally crashed. So like Dun & Bradstreet and Gregor May were our customers. They're like, uh, we have no access to our systems. I'm like, Dimitri, what's going on? He goes, oh, it just crashed. <laughs> so I learned like, okay, not a good idea to migrate live clients. Bad, bad idea. So you kind of go, okay, let's migrate them backwards. So this is what we went through, but we took them to market, right? We got through, we got another client, another client, pretty soon we had 3 million people in our town data warehouse. So what's really cool is at one point I called Dimitri, I said, we have a problem. You haven't invoiced me in 18 months. So the thing is I'm accruing this, but my like, bookkeepers are telling me, I got to get this off my books. Can you please send me an invoice? I know it sounds like a weird problem to have, but you actually develop like that kind of a relationship with the partner so you could have a very different conversation. So that's another one. Loop Engage, they used to be uh, M Resource. Anybody remember that? Okay. The text, so we basically piloted them when they had a text SMS server and we were doing, for Amazon, we were filling warehouses of 1,200 people using text and SMS. This is like our first iteration of mobile recruiting before there was any concept of mobile apply. So here's our high tech, low tech, no tech. We rented cab tops, bus backs, and radio ads in Goodyear, Arizona. And we said, hey, if you wanna work at Amazon, text 92376 to Amazon. And we used SMS to literally fill 1200 jobs in 92 days. It's kinda weird, and you go, hey, I think we can improve in this. I think we should have this thing where people could, because it was press one for like if you could lift 40 pounds. Great. Press two if you haven't killed someone in three years. Great. It was like that. It was, and I'm funny because I'm getting goosebumps as I'm telling you. This is what we went through. So there could be a couple others. And now you kind of have a story, even Bill, because you know me a bit, of how I built this business from zero to 60 million euro in pretty much no time. Because we were literally bringing a sandwich to an all-you-can-eat buffet. I mean, that's basically what it was. Between the staffing agencies and incumbent RPOs, how is it possible that yet another company can start and go from nowhere to being the number one provider in the world? Like literally in, in less than five years. It was basically unheard of because a lot of these people had you know, really established business. Sue had a great business. You know, Rosalind Blair, great business. These people had great, great, great businesses. Uh, so this was our secret, but you know, this is the cross that we had to wear, is we had to do this all the time. So I created an innovation budget. I hid it in a line called Machinery R&R &R because even my bookkeepers didn't know what that was. But it was about 180000 a year, and it was the same every year, so they never questioned it. So my little innovation budget was there. This is where we try stuff. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Usually, most of it didn't. But the ones that worked, it was great. And we actually were very proud because we fundamentally knew eventually the technology companies that we picked that took to market would be big, so let's promote them now, as opposed to, anybody ever see uh, Clear and Present Danger? It's an old movie, I'm going back to like when Harrison Ford was before 40. Uh, but it was a great movie because it was, uh, you know, he's the detective guy that they're remaking these movies now. Yeah, so it was a great line because the president was like, peers with the guy that was doing really kind of shady stuff on the surface, but a really good guy. He's always the bad dude. So he said, so what do I do? Do I deny knowing him? He goes, no, you tell him you were friends. He goes, in fact, when you walk off the airplane, the first thing I want you to say, I realize you guys investing a great friend of mine. And let me tell you about him. And in five minutes it was done. So instead of hiding the fact and trying to sort of, oh, this is ours, we realized that let's promote that fact because eventually they're going to be successful and it's going to reflect very positively on us. And that's what happened. By the way, it could have not happened. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like, I'm just telling you the success story. There's also the other side of the coin. So this is just like a background and I want you to have this, this context is that we were no strangers to looking at technology um, and adopting that technology and even jimmy rigging with like duct tape and stuff because we were not allowed to build technology because Adeco was a services company. So we were like the antithesis of anything having to do with technology. It's a big word, sorry. Um, so it was, you know, it was really, really, um, it was really, really difficult. So, so let's now jump in into how do you work with HRs and RPOs. It is a strategy, it shouldn't be the strategy. Without getting into the next topic, which is how do you sell to HR, I wanna kind of not go there. Essentially, one of the things you need to 
ask yourself and then make decisions on what will be your go-to-market strategy from a direct sales perspective. Are you going to do direct sales to clients? Are you going to do indirect sales to clients? Are you going to use channel sales? Are you going to use VARs? Are you going to use distributors? And I'm not kind of throwing all those in there because they are different relationships. And the value proposition is different. I kind of joked about you know, the constituency thing. I figured out, like, I don't know, I want to say 1997, you have to sell three people. And each one needs a different value proposition. It's kind of like that in partners. A partner is not a partner is not a partner. You really have to understand the value prop. So some simple definitions. Okay, this is going to be stupid simple, but let's say it anyway. So whenever you have an O and an acronym, it usually stands for outsourcing. I'm not advocating these acronyms, but these are the acronyms that people use. So you have recruitment process outsourcing companies and HR outsourcing companies. On the RPO side, sometimes this includes contract hires. If you go to the UK, if you go to continental Europe, if you go to Asia, it's common. In the US, they typically don't focus on contract hires. They're kind of getting there now in their marketing brochures, but they're not actually doing it. Um, it sometimes includes provision of technology, sometimes it doesn't. It sometimes is just candidate sourcing and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's just traditional staffing. And sometimes, well, to steal from my Finnish friend, it just depends. So the problem is, is fundamentally it's a service and we make it look really kind of glorious by wrapping technology around it. But essentially what they do is they provide a service. Right? And, and that service has to hit the fundamental value proposition of outsourcing. And if you understand what their value proposition is, then we could start thinking about how the hell do we actually sell them? Because we have to know how they go to market. It's like Microsoft understood how Dell went to market and they had to devise a scheme that allowed Dell to become successful. Then as a result, Microsoft became successful. So this is really key. So if you think about the, the and by the way, on the HRO side, not to gloss over it, I say it used to be a big fad in the mid 2000s. So the first HR outsourcing conference had three and a half thousand people. The last one I believe had about 120. Uh, so what happened to all those people? They didn't change professions. It's kind of a joke. A lot of them went to the providers. What basically happened was there was this big thing called multi-process HR outsourcing. I think it was underscored with Converges did a $1.1 billion deal with DuPont that literally then fell apart and Converges went bankrupt and I think they sold for $100 million. So this is a, a company that did $7.8 billion in sales that sold for $100 million. So that's like the definition of what not to become. Um, anyways, from an investor perspective, that's not a good ROI. <laughs> uh, so, so that kind of went in now. But what is very common today is what's called single process HRO or multi process HRO, where you do like payroll and benefits. But the whole thing of like my mess for less, the buildings, the chairs, the computers, and all that, that kind of went supernova. It was like a three year thing. It, you know, boom, red dwarf, poof, just kind of blew up. And in a, in a companies like Exult and Convergence, they just, they just don't even exist anymore. Uh, and they were pretty big companies. So, um, so here's some logos, of, I, I'm not advocating here, I'm just kind of giving you, here's some logos what I call credible providers. Credible is a really key operative. If you're thinking about working with HRO and RPO providers, start with the world credible. Because most of these providers are either consultants who are really good at telling you what you want to hear, or they're salespeople who basically take candies from babies. Okay, because if you think about most RPOs, they were started by very successful, very entrepreneurial salespeople. Okay. They were so good, they go, you know what? This staffing thing sucks. Let's go and invent a new business. Don't, don't get to recruiting program. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so this is the thing. So, so you have to understand that these are credible because these companies actually really exist. They have real clients with real growth and real capital. You don't want to be selling to someone who looks really great on paper and go, wow, we just did a really great joint venture with this other starving artist. That doesn't work. Commiseration does not help you build a business. Okay, so don't get in bed with other people that are hurting just as bad as you are. Spend 10 more, you know, 10 times the time trying to get in bed with the right people as opposed to a lot of people that are in the same shape you are. So these are some credible ones. There are some others. Uh, so let's tackle now the basic value proposition. This is really profound. Ready? So the basic value proposition of outsourcing, whether it's technology, whether it's services, number one is it has to be either as fast or faster. So as you're building your tech or you're pitching somebody on adopting your tech, the question you have to ask yourself, is it as fast or faster? Not 
wish, not aspirational, do you follow? But is it as fast as faster, right? Current state. Is it as cost effective or cheaper? Not five years out with the ROI, but today, because HR buys a five-year ROI and CFO buys cash out on June 27. Did you follow? This is like why this is really important, yeah? And then is it as good or better? Now notice, it could be as fast, as cost effective, and as good. And that still qualifies for the value proposition. Because the next thing is, in some instances, they're not actually replacing what they're doing with what you're doing. They're buying capabilities that they don't currently have. And this is really important. So when you're going in there, ask yourself, am I disrupting something? And am I a change agent? Or am I preaching, hey, I'm going to take you to the Holy Land? because I'm gonna add this innovation that you currently don't have. Because how you pitch them is going to be different. Right? We could talk about that in drinks later, but how you pitch them is going to be different. If you're disrupting versus adding. Uh, and that's really key. Um, now, here's the other thing, this is really important. Every single services provider feel they can do exactly what you're doing better. Is it true? No, but they feel that way. So, you have to understand that your biggest competitor to them dealing with you is them doing it themselves. I think once as an entrepreneur, you kind of have this come to Jesus conversation and you realize that your competitor is not the market, but it's the client doing it themselves, you're gonna completely elevate your value proposition. Because it's no longer is my widget better than what their widget. My widget is better than you can ever do. And that's really critical. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing is you have to understand their point. By the way, this is exactly what they are selling, right? So this is when you come in. If you're pitching what they're pitching, you go, hey, we have alignment of interest. Hey, we're very compatible. And all these wonderful, you know, the cherubims come out and all this other stuff. So all these wonderful things happen. Um, and, and here's like the, the, the problem statement, right? Your growth curve goes, I'm going to go from here to here. What do you think an outsourcing growth curve looks like? I'm going to go from here to here. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. This is, um, one, of, one of the things that I'm seeing really predominant in the market at the moment is the RPO companies are trying to buy in a or resell limited solutions yeah. to start some companies in order to stand out against other RPOs, essentially, or to be able to make a bit more margin from a fixed margin of five, six year project. Um, and most of the contracts are trying to tie you into a Solar RPO relationship with that one vector that's AMS or COP2 or whatever it is. How do these guys choose which one is the one I want to get to pay um, So I could just from my own experience, I actually said no. It wasn't choosing which one, I said no. I said, because essentially what you're doing is you want to put me out of business. I actually had this conversation. I had it with three partners. I said, oh, you want to put me out of business. They're like, what do you mean? I said, because if I sign an exclusive with you, I can't grow, which means I can't get capital, which means I go out of business. So I can't help you. Well, you can grow, you just can't do another RPO. Well, the interesting thing is, is that you essentially become restricted. But the key of why, remember I said before, you have to change how you prospect and look for the right partners. This isn't about convincing a partner of why that shouldn't happen. It's about spending time looking for a partner that believes as you believe. So I believed, and I never asked exclusivity for any of those guys, because essentially, if I asked them for exclusivity, I paid them $180,000 a year. You cannot build a business on that. They kind of fundamentally have to go, and I had to basically go to the conferences and help my friends sell them, because I realized the more successful they became, the better the product became. My beneficiary, I took them to market. So that was really, really key. And I think our differentiation was, is that a lot of my competitors at the time, they were white labeling the solutions, and they were pitching it as their own. But we never really did that. And so we kind of differentiated from the get-go because we always prominently displayed the people's brand. I mean, I could show you deck after deck after deck with ClearFit. It was about saying this is our proprietary screening solution. Does that make sense? So it's kind of a, like I would recommend not looking for those kinds of prospects. It's, it's the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So which RPO is playing which way? Because we don't RPO market. Yeah. So advising these guys about who might play. Yeah. There are, so I could talk about both uh, RPOs and HROs. Uh, in, in the recruitment space, the, the big guys are not, go, unless you find sort of 
you know, you could go talk to Rebecca Callahan, right, or Rosalind Boyer. They're adopt, but by and large, or maybe Sue, but by and large, they're not going to be adopters of early technology. I could probably give you six names and say, okay, good luck. I'm thinking more of the first. Which yeah. ones play nicely? Which ones? Uh, I would say Hudson will play nicely. Um, even AMS will play nicely because, I mean, we've been working with them and now they're talking about us. So it's not like a secret. Uh, they, we just, we were with them at RBS. So I think some of them will play nice. I think it's actually, this is purely opinion now. I think a lot of it comes down to the risk tolerance of the individual. And like, do they trust you to be in front of their client? This is completely hypothetical. I have no evidence of this. But I seemed like when we got the trust, it really wasn't an issue. But I've literally, I literally one time flew 2,700 miles to tell them I cannot do business with them. And they were shocked. And I said, because you're a human being and I owe you telling that in person. But I can't do business with them. I simply cannot agree to those terms. So, and it happens. You have to, again, differentiation. Sometimes you have to say, we don't do that. We're different. It's just a choice. And I think that's the challenge a lot of, a lot of you are facing. If you choose a route to market, uh, which is a valid one, which is either the single platform, a sales force, or an Apple, or via an RPO, VMS, whatever it is, via a AMS or Kelly, whoever it might be, it's that restrictive contract bit that says we can offer you early potential growth very quickly and probably we're offering you an exit route as a buyer because if the customers use it, we're going to put some cash in now and we're going to buy it, we'll buy it later and make it our technology. That's quite a normal route, but there's restrictions that you're very yeah. So my experience has been part. don't take industry money at the outset because you're done. Um, it, it's, it's sort of like you, it's just experience. To put 10 people in a room, you get 12 opinions. That's just a disclaimer. My experience is don't take industry money early on. It's, it, you want to take it later on for growth. You don't want to take it early on to kind of get you going. Don't sign any restrictive agreements. Spend three years getting your first client as opposed to kind of marrying up with all these people and trying to give the house away. Um, you'll be better off. We, like I said, we, we struggled with the two. Um, the, 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 there's this sort of, and this is, this is sort of like, how should I say, it's false hope, okay? They are in the business of building their own business. They will partner with you to the extent that you help them do that. The second you no longer help them do that, the problem is technology is very disruptive. There's the next guy that's going to help them do that. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of, am I done? There's uh, not a lot of. Uh, yeah, we, we only have a little bit of time. Okay, uh, cool. I, I, I actually really only have one slide that, left. Uh, I would hate to see people go without yeah. hearing what you have to say about what actually drives the HR tech bond. Yeah. So, um, perfect. That's the next slide. So, um, so from, from the perspective of what, what actually gets, gets people to, uh, so I don't want to go over, you're doing about HR tech selling, right? So I promise I won't go there. I'll stick to the providers. Um, from the provider side, uh, you, you have to figure out how, how your product or service is going to allow them to differentiate. So this is a, a very real conversation I just had because I'm, I'm in your shoes now, right? So I'm talking to the CEO of the company and I'm pitching all this great stuff. She's like, oh, this is great. I said, okay, turn, this, turn the like, microphone off. I'm like, ready? Okay, this is the best sales tool you're ever going to get. If all you did was license my stuff and you never used it, you'd sell five more deals. You know what she said? I'm in. It doesn't matter. The point is, you're in. And once you're in, you're in. And once you're in, they use it. And once they use it, you have your use case. So the idea is, how do you sell to them? You have to understand their pain point. If they are closing deals left and right, they really don't need you. If they're struggling selling in the marketplace, they need you to differentiate. So you got to position itself as like, hey, if you take this to market and you're competing with 16 others, I'm going to help you close that next deal. But let's say they're already closing deals. Then you could position it such that, hey, this is an operations play. You know, product two. So she basically said, hey, I'm going to have to adjust my sourcing plan for next year. I could take eight heads out of the equation. Right? So it's like it's same product, different value proposition, right? So understanding who you're pitching it to makes a lot of sense. So if you're talking to somebody like a manpower, that's what I call just a zero margin business, right? So if they generate, what, 1.8% something like that EBITDA, if you could get them like you know, 10 basis points, right? 10 basis points across 20 billion is a lot of money. It's a shitload of money. 
So, so think about it in those kinds of terms. If you talk into a company that's basically a public utility and that's a massive, massive infrastructure, you want to talk about productivity and et cetera. If you talk into a company that's a sales-centric organization, you could help them win deals, right? But the last thing you need to do is fall in love with your product when you're talking to them. The key is don't fall in love with the product. Sell to them as if you were given therapy about how your product could help them in the marketplace. And that's really key. So when we looked at ClearFit, for example, you know, it just clearly helped me sell the product at the time when we implemented it because no one really had it completely integrated into the recruitment process. It was kind of like, oh, there's your assessment system. But we took Mobile Apply and integrated it with ClearFit. All of a sudden, we had literally a streamlined mobile application process with assessment. And oh, by the way, each candidate got a really nice report. And that was really, really cool. So, you know, when I was out in, let's say, Silicon Valley, they love that because it's this high touch, quality of service, touchy feely. You know, you get all this uh, candidate satisfaction. If I'm in New York, didn't really talk about that much. Didn't really care. So, this is kind of some of the ideas about how to do it. You still didn't talk about the pain and the pleasure. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I have and to. The, and the, but then we're done. 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and we, t we actually went into quite detail in, in, uh, in Helsinki, but so some of you who went to school and you took this in college, I'm not telling anything you don't know, but if you're hearing it for the first time, basically human beings do two things in life. I could actually boil this down to like this simple. We either seek pleasure or we avoid pain. It's really crazy, but that's all we do all day long. Seek pleasure, avoid pain. HR people outside of a few people are wired to avoid pain. Okay, so understand this. Do not go sell them opportunity. They don't, it's like blah, 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 blah. It's like Linus playing the piano. Don't make any sense. HR people avoid pain. That's why they go to HR. That's what they do. So all of you are sitting there and go, how do we get there? Done? You're never going to do it because you're not behaviorally wired that way. Every once in a while, you get like an MBA guy or gal that says, you know what? I'm going to go fix that HR department. That's your early adopter because they're not wired that way. But like, I, like I said, 458 times, I could tell you, like, I could count how many people were not wired that way, like right here. And everybody else, it's just avoid pain, just avoid problems. I don't want to get fired, right? I want to get a seat at the table. It's like, I want, I want, I want, I want. Yeah, right. So, so think about that when you're structuring your pitch. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt, what I call the FUD factor, okay? FUD factor, that's how you sell to HR. But if you're lucky and you find a cool one, go, I'm sorry. And you start again because you realize that they're wired a little bit differently. But by and large, FUD. <laughs> Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We call it the FUD factor. <laughs> Thank you, Robert.